participants, dear colleagues, is 11.30. So it is 11.30 Copenhagen time, and as we plan, we start our webinar. We welcome you at the webinar of the Virtual Medical Concilium of the WHO Euro. And today we gathered together in order to uh, present and discuss different models of care offered to various population groups affected by tuberculosis. My name is Elmira Gurbanova. Uh, I am the coordinator of the Concilium, and I warmly welcome all those who joined us. We have some uh, announcements. You can listen to the speakers, and you can look through the presentations both in English and in Russian. And in order to do so, you need to click a special sign at the bottom of your screen that looks like a globe, and you can choose uh, the language of the materials that will be presented. Alexander show materials in English. I'm glad to tell you that all recordings of our presentations will be available at our website, and we will share the link in chat. Without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Askal Yedilbaev, Regional Advisor on Tuberculosis and Drug-Resistant Tuberculosis, of uh, uh, the Joint Division for Infectious Diseases at the WHO Euro. Dear Almir, thank you very much. I would like to welcome dear participants of the 24th webinar of the Virtual Medical Concilium of uh, the European region. And I would like to welcome all of you, as well as our distinguished speakers, who will tell us about the approaches that we can call people-centered approaches that are to be introduced in special situations. Despite um, various challenges, we, people who work in public health, people who work in various healthcare services, are to ensure uninterrupted TB care and provide people-centered services, making sure that patients complete the course of treatment because interruptions of treatment can lead to some unfavorable treatment outcomes. Once again, I would like to welcome all of you. 104 participants have joined us today, and I hope very much that all of you will find this webinar useful. Our Webinar today is the first one in the series of webinars um, focused on people-centered care. The next webinar will be a logical continuation of the first one, and we will have the second one in 2024. Now I give the floor to Elmira. Thank you very much, Asgar. Today, we have a very busy agenda. We will have several presentations. And at the end of the webinar, we will have a session for questions and answers. We will really appreciate if you could share your questions in chat. This way, we will be able to use the time during the session of questions and answers in um, the most efficient manner possible. Um, or we will be able to share answers to your questions in writing. So please use the option of chats in order to ask your questions. Without any further ado, I would like to uh, present Dr. Lana Syed from the WHO headquarters, who will tell us about the new guidance on engagement of communities and civil society to end tuberculosis. Lana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and greetings everyone. I will be presenting today in English. So my name is Lana Sayed. Um, I'm a social scientist working for WHO Global Tuberculosis Program uh, in the headquarters. And just to thank once again, the organizers for this invitation. 
I'm just going to share my presentation and please kindly asking the, if uh, you can confirm that it's displayed correctly in uh, in the slide mode. Can you make it uh, again as full screen, please, Lana? Mm -hmm. Duplicate slide. Uh, oh, swap, swap, swap. Swap. Mm -hmm. One second. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Oops. One second, please. There is a small gap. So. And is it displaying correctly? One second. No, we just seen an open presentation. Now it's perfect. Now okay. all good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So um, as announced, I will be talking very briefly about the guidance that we newly launched um, just uh, two weeks ago on the engagement of communities and civil society to end tuberculosis. Just to say that we have three upcoming uh, translations, which are going to happen uh, early next year. And um, these include Russian. So we anticipate that the Russian version of the guidance will be available definitely in the first half of next year. So um, to start, we know, of course, that um, the burden, globally speaking, the burden of tuberculosis remains enormous and that more than uh, 10 and a half million people fall ill with tuberculosis and there is still more than one and a half million deaths uh, per year, yearly. It uh, remains a major uh, call, uh, cause of death and it affects uh, populations inequitably particularly those who are in vulnerable conditions are particularly prone to fall ill with the TB disease. We also know that the NTB strategy really puts a strong focus on the importance of the engagement of communities and civil societies. And this is included both uh, in the pillar, this pillar number two of the strategy and is one of the four key principles um, which you can see on the slide. Uh, more recently, the UN high-level meeting just now in September um, this year, um, the political declaration really underscores the importance of active and meaningful engagement uh, of communities, as well as the importance to, to you know, ensure uh, uh, sufficient resources for meaningful community engagement and the parliamentary civil society and so on. So these are some of the elements of how we embarked on, on developing a, uh, a new guidance. What we did is the process to develop the guidance uh, included an evaluation of the previous approach called Engage TB with a number of focus group discussions from uh, selected countries and implementers with the key informant interviews. We had established also a steering committee with the Civil Society Task Force, uh, which you might be aware of, as well as the WHO representatives for all three levels of the organization, so headquarters, region, and country. We held extensive, at least 10 virtual and in-person uh, consultations involving communities, national TV program representatives, civil societies, uh, experts, um, and so on. Uh, as I mentioned, the WHO Civil Society task force, played, um, uh, task force played a major role in the document development. So it's really a, an expression, it's a good mix of an expression of priorities of communities, affected communities and task force, as well as the, the experts and WHO. So very briefly, some of the key features of the guidance. It targets both uh, the health and community system under what we call uh, one system, which uh, asks, calls for, you know, seeing the health system as a, as a continuum of, um, uh, of the community system and vice versa. And moving away from, you know, the usual uh, maybe tensions and complexities of these two very fundamentally different stakeholders uh, working together. It's short, it's only about 30 pages without annexes, and it's very careful to use the language 
that is, uh, you know, attractive to multiple stakeholders, to, of course, national programs and the ministries of health, but also to affected communities and uh, civil society stakeholders. It's full of uh, visuals and it has in each chapter uh, take home messages with a um, uh, models of action with examples uh, wherever possible. And I think one of the key principles is that, you know, the community engagement is maybe different from a number of technical areas to be in tuberculosis in the sense that we often say one size uh, can't fit all. But with the community engagement, uh, this uh, grassroots action and contextual innovation is really key to have a strong and meaningful community response to TB. So we know we are also in the era of universal health coverage and the vehicle um, to uh, ensure universal he health coverage is the primary healthcare framework. And here on the, on the left, we see the three key elements, uh, components of the primary healthcare, which are actually fully aligned, aligned with the NTP strategy. They're integrated health services, um, community empowered communities and people and the multi-sectoral policy and action. So not only are we in full alignment with the NTP strategy, but also we were quite careful in the in the development and the process to develop the new guidance to align with the the primary health care for uh, uh, primary health care framework and um, and its vision. So a little bit more about key points uh, of the guidance. So as I said, the guidance really puts person uh, affected by TB and people with a TB disease at the center. And around it, we have partners uh, in the community engagement approach with uh, what we call the one system approach with community systems and the health systems operating under an umbrella um, under the one system. One more uh, key um, angle of the guidance is to keep in mind that, you know, we often talk about, oh, in your setting is community engaged and the answer could be yes or no. Well, we are moving away from that and saying that uh, community engagement is not static. And actually, if you look at these five different levels of uh, community engagement, community engagement can take different forms and it goes to the left from informing the community about some activity or action that's going to take place to the grassroots level towards more mature, um, more mature, you know, levels of community engagement with the most mature being fully empowered communities who are self-reliant and can independently create, uh, implement and manage their own solutions. So different countries are going to be and communities are going to be at very different stages of community engagement. But regardless, I think what's important to keep in mind is that um, under the vision of this guidance, the uh, community systems and stakeholders together with the health system have joint kind of responsibility and the shared responsibility, which um, to be translated into practice uh, kind of should start with listening what we see here at the bottom. So engaging in the dialogue with community stakeholders is really a key first step to listen to and learn from communities as experts in their own uh, you know, needs and local realities um, in order to you know, inform uh, policies, actions, and so on, which are often delivered by the national programs. So here uh, we also, which is um, a key angle in the guidance is we try to be as, uh, as concrete as possible. So we developed a model that looks at the, at the uh, uh, person's TB pathway and gave examples of activities that can take place uh, in healthy communities where people are at risk of TB, which aim to you know, increase self-reliance as health care and so on and so forth towards uh, then uh, types of community engagement activities that uh, many countries are most frequently implementing, which are, you know, 
uh, activities that aim at uh, facilitating access to diagnosis and helping people through different community support activities uh, go through the treatment and reach um, a treatment success. And then with some activities that can happen, you know, that communities are probably best placed to take on in uh, in uh, in the phase after TB treatment to help with uh, TB associated disabilities and um, help with legal services and so on. And finally, what we see around are the cross cutting activities, which are really essential, uh, no matter what uh, the context and the country wants to prioritize, um, which are cross cutting and range from, you know, advocacy, advocacy for increase of domestic financing, community monitoring and community-led monitoring, contributions to multi-sectoral accountability framework, demand creation, and so on. So here, uh, what we wanted to uh, underline is because uh, we've been talking, as we said, in TB response for many decades about community engagement, but now we are moving away and we are starting to look at meaningful community engagement. So meaningful community engagement is really an engagement where community and civil society and stakeholders are not only engaged in service delivery, um, but are also fully engaged in, you know, key programmatic activities of planning, decision making, creation of na national strategic plan, of course, its implementation, external reviews, and so on and so forth. So. For this, um, we conducted the survey and we realized that, yes, countries have moved very long way in community-based service delivery, but probably what is a priority that would need strengthening on average, globally speaking, is to how to move towards meaningful systematic engagement with a formal role of for communities in national decision making. So for this to happen, we identified three key components of the enabling environment or the foundation that needs to be in place for communities to be able to be engaged meaningfully. One is a community or civil society functional network or group or coordinating body at the, not only at the, at the national level, but also subnationally. Um, sustainable financing of core activities and also conducive policy environment or legal basis for, for community engagement. And this is then the backbone, if you like, of, of community engagement as we know it in the, in the programmatic cycle um, in, in each and every context with, you know, again, emphasis put that bottom up approach and community kind of the freedom of communities to really come forward with their own priorities and approaches can lead to a strong national uh, response under the under the national umbrella and the strategic plan. So a little bit then about uh, the measurements, because you might probably be aware that the WHO for the last 10 years has had two core indicators which are recommended to track community engagement. And those two uh, aim really to track what is the um, community contribution to key outcomes. So th they seek really to measure um, uh, community engagement in service delivery. So th this would be community um, contribution to, you know, referrals. To So how many people who were referred by community and civil society stakeholders were eventually confirmed with TB? And secondly, what is the treatment success of people who benefited from any form of community-based treatment support? So now we are saying that we need to also be able to say something about um, this meaningful engagement. So service delivery, okay, the countries have been really progressing nicely, but what about how do we measure community representation, you know, this meaningful engagement in decision-making. Well, in order to do that, um, we are proposing two um, rather uh, simple indicators, which are meant to serve as a proxy for uh, meaningful engagement. One of them being, um, are the representatives of TB affected communities and civil societies, do they have a formal role in the key, uh, key national TB program processes? such as development, as we said, of a national strategic plan and uh, so on. And what is the level of committed funding uh, available for co community engagement activities as the percentage of the overall national TB response budget? 
So these, of course, is the starting point, and then uh, many additional, probably in-depth, qualitative and quantitative measures are needed in order to really tease out the extent. Also to say, because community engagement is not something that can be well measured only by quantitative uh, measures, so we do have a whole uh, section on the guidance of how uh, and what kind of angles of community engagement can be measured and look into depending on the country context, and also a whole section of community-led monitoring, which is a form, as you know, of systematic feedback, uh, which is completely autonomously run uh, by the communities, which aims at improving and monitoring the quality of the health services um, available uh, in the country or local setting. So that was it. This was really a snapshot. Um, we had, as I said, an enormous level of support to develop uh, this guidance. And also, as I said, uh, please remember that Russian um, version of the guidance is coming in the first part of next year. And in the meantime, I had put here a QR code, which you're free to scan, which would take you to the electronic version of the, um, of the community guidance. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your attention and for this invitation. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lana, for an interesting presentation. Thank you very much for sharing this very important document. I would like to ask all our participants to ask questions in the chat. And now I would like to give the floor to the next speaker. Uh, with uh, gratitude and appreciation, I would like to give the floor to the NTP manager in Ukraine, Dr. Yana Terleva, who will share uh, the information about challenges, uh, achievements, and victories in TP control in the context of war. Yana, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, dear participants. I will make my presentation in English. I will need a couple of uh, seconds in order to present my slides. Choose uh, the preferred language and let me know if you can hear me well and if you can see my slides well. To have the opportunity to share our experience from Ukraine. And uh, Ukraine is one of the high priority countries for drug resistant tuberculosis of WHO. And every year, more than 4,000 people are diagnosed with MDR. And uh, Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine has lasted almost two years. Uh, that will highly likely to cause deterioration of the situation with tuberculosis, not only in Ukraine, but also in the European region. According to the National TB program, 475 people with TB have become internally displaced persons, and about 300 people with TB may remain in temporary occupied territory by Russia, and over 300 people with TB remain abroad, and still under these extreme conditions, 12,000 people with TB in Ukraine receive medical care. In condition of war, economic crisis, increasing migration process, infrastructural damage, and the lack of human resources, risk of uh, the land strategic achievements in the field of ending TB have emerged. And uh, since the beginning of the full-scale military aggression, in uh, 2022, the National TB program of Ukraine faced uh, unprecedented challenges associated with the full-scale war against Ukraine. Destruction of healthcare facilities, forced migration, and the limited funding which jeopardize a basic human right to health. Since the beginning of the full scale military invasion, nearly 200 healthcare facilities have been completely destroyed, and more than 100, 600 healthcare facilities have been damaged, and uh, more than five. 
hundred pharmacies have been damaged as well. According to the WHO survey, one of five patients or 22% cannot purchase the necessary medicine. We also faced additional challenges associated with a full-scale war. Limited access to medical care is uh, caused by poor transport infrastructure, destroyed bridges, healthcare facilities, constant missile strikes. Each increases difficulties in TB detection and diagnosis. The situation is completely is complicated by the exhausting of the medical staff. According to the international experts, more than 15 million people will need mental health care after the end of war. According to the result of the survey conducted among the staff of medical facilities, the main barriers to the provision of medical services was the lack of internet and mobile communications and electricity due to the destruction of the infrastructure by the enemy. It was important to both for doctors and patients to be in touch. According to the International Organization for Migration, more than 10 million people became forced migrations with the support of WHO team, uh, WHO Regional Office for Europe, a data exchange platform, platform on uh, Ukrainian patients was quickly created between all countries. We are grateful to the Euro WHO team for creating this platform because it contributed to the continuation of continue, continuation of treatment of people abroad. And uh, I'm a focal point uh, for data exchange from the part of Ukrainian NTP, and all of you could contact with me if you need. Unfortunately, patients with MDRTB from Ukraine who moved to the EU countries due to the, due to the war initially didn't have access to treatment regimens which they used to have in Ukraine because novel drugs were unavailable and didn't include in national recommendations of the EU countries. However, we know that currently countries are working to ensure access to modern treatment. And uh, with the aim of strategic leadership in the conditions of a full-scale war, urgent management actions were taken that allowed to TB services to adapt quickly and prevent interruption to access of medicine and uh, diagnostics on the country level. First of all, the national action plan was developed uh, for the provision of medical assistance to TB patients in wartime conditions. In order to help countries, WHO has developed recommendations for preparing for a national emergency response in the field of healthcare for all hazards. We also used these recommendations. The health cluster was created for the urgent coordination of the activities of all partners under the coordination of the NTP and WHO. At first, the cluster was held weekly and now monthly. The communication headquarters for crisis communications and information was also established. Protection of personal data of TB patients has been strengthened. And despite the organization measures taken, it was it was impossible to prepare for the cynical actions uh, of the aggressors. We could not imagine that the Russians occupies would systematically destroy hospitals, shell ambulance and kill healthcare workers and other civilians. At the beginning of the war against Ukraine, the country had stocks of medicine and uh, supplies from six months uh, to a year on average. And NTP worked in conditions of uh, significant risks and uh, complications in the procurement and logistics of medicine. In agreements with supplier, there are major conditions. Supply in uh, complicated due to the lack of air traffic our Ukraine. Urgent additional procurements of medicine and diagnostic supplies were made with the help of the Global Fund 
uh, to avoid interruption of treatment. Additional uh, houses were set up for drugs storage. Uh, as the outpatient stage, medicine were provided for a long period in the first days of the full-scale war. Dispensing medicine to patients was for several months, since the delivery of medicine was significant, significantly completed by constant rocked attacks and uh, transport was limited. Giving patients med medications for a long period of time uh, was one of the most important decisions that contributed to the continuing of treatment and save lives. DOT and uh, video supported treatment were used uh, when possible and limited. Our solution to issues related to permanent lack of electricity, to ensure electricity and communication, uh, satellite communication system were implemented, additional generator power banks and warm blankets were purchased. And uh, despite these uh, uh, difficult situations, the new standard, which is based on the most recent WHO recommendations, was approved only one month after the WHO updated its DR treatment guidelines. Basic principle of TB treatment in Ukraine and the new approaches to healthcare deliveries. According to the Ministry of Health, about 20% of the population has limited access to medical care due to destroyed healthcare facilities and uh, logistical limitations. Therefore, mobile clinics were widely implemented with the support of the international partners and civil society. Also, ultra-portable X-ray machines uh, how to carry out diagnostics in outreach areas. Telemedicine mo modalities have also been significantly no problem. <laughs> and uh, now Ukrainian NTP provided access to modern short treatment regimens. Uh, it uh, was noting uh, that uh, NTP Ukraine was uh, actively participating in operation research projects such as modified uh, short re treatment regimens for uh, RIFTB such as uh, MSTR and BIPAL, and especially patients' treatment with shorter and more effective regimens have displayed high treatment success rate compared to traditional longer treatment options. And now you can see preliminary requ uh, requirement result of patients. Uh, notably, patients treated with shorter regimens have displayed high treatment success rate compared to traditional longer treatment options. Preliminary data for BIPAL suggest an impressive success rate of uh, 89%. And uh, starting from February 2023, we have been introducing in, uh, an innovative VPAL regimen under programmatic conditions. Switching to short regimens was one of the best decisions for our patients in war condition too. A number of activities were carried out together with uh, W2 to organize assistance for people with TV who became forced migrants. And uh, in conclusion, Ukraine continues to implement important healthcare reforms and uh, demonstrate significant political commitment to the new political declarations and uh, W2 recommendations. The most difficult challenges uh, the war during the war was the destruction of the infrastructure of TB facilities disruption of logistic routes, scaling up on forced migration and lack of electricity and mobile communications, the solidarity and the commitment of the facilities, medical and uh, social services, civil society organization are strong. They continue to work, even risking their, our lives. 
It is important to continue to support healthcare workers and take care of medical health issues, including this uh, of people with TB. At the same time, we draw your attention to the fact that the WHO guidelines on these issues have been published, uh, with, which will help to solve these problems and should be part of the policies of the provisions of medical care. Access to TB care is uh, injured in general. However, there are difficulties to accessing TB services at every stage of uh, care delivery. Therefore, it is important to introduce shorter regimens so that people recover faster and provide social support. According to the estimates of the Minister of Health, Ukraine will need from 50.6 to 20 billion euros to fix the damage caused to the healthcare system by Russian aggression. We hope, we hope for and uh, appreciate continued support from international partners. And we are grateful to the government of countries, international partners, especially W TV Alliance, Top TV Partnership, Global, Global Fund, USAID, uh, GDF, MSA, Red Cross, International Medical Corps, TB Euro Coalition, France Five Percent Initiative, uh, Alliance for Public Health, uh, 100%, uh, business partners, patients organizations such as TB People, and international partners for their comprehensive assistance that contributed to ensuring access to medicine and uh, diagnostics, and we hope for future support and collaboration. Uh, that's the end of my presentation, and I would like to say a few words in Russian so that cover as many people as possible so that you hear uh, our true experience, which and um, things experienced by the Ukraine, you can switch to the language you choose. Perhaps one of the major conclusions is that today we live in a very difficult time and in a very complex world. In the complex world, any country can face extreme emergency situation, not only wars, um, emergency, health, uh, uh, like COVID-19, the negative consequences of which are experienced by uh, programs such as a national TB program, experienced by other countries. Uh, we know that many countries have not uh, yet fully recovered and have not recovered their resources uh, from the crisis of COVID-19. No matter what we do all together, we perhaps cannot prepare 100% to an emergency. Uh, the challenges we face are very difficult to predict. But nevertheless, as experience shows, it's very important to develop and introduce um, emergency response plans. And Ukraine's experience reveals that development of such a plan uh, within the first days of war helped a lot to systema uh, systematize the directions in which we needed to work further. Uh, thus, we call upon all countries not to sit waiting for emergencies, because all countries can face them. You should start working today with WHO Europe, together with your international partners, internal partners, so that you are 100% prepared and able to mitigate the consequences of the possible emergencies. Because uh, we need to plan ahead, and the experience we started also shows that uh, having such uh, preparedness plans can help you to go through them with less losses. If your countries uh, have been working on strangling healthcare systems, on improving outpatient care, on improving multi-sectoral collaboration, if you have been actively engaging civil society, if you have been building stronger uh, collaborations with all the stakeholders, you 
will be ready to anything. That's the strong basis, the foundation uh, for overcoming any possible difficulties. Uh, another important conclusion, which is obvious for us today and which we would like to broadcast is that innovations today uh, must be implemented as quickly as possible. They must be scaled up um, in the scale of the country or at the wildest scale of the region so that uh, every country has innovations available as quick, quickly as possible. Now it takes too long and our patients cannot wait for something with proven uh, efficacy be available. Understanding that innovations in the area of prevention, treatment, uh, support and care are the driving force helping patients to recover quicker. We, uh, despite the war, we concentrate all, all our resources and all our forces so that we have a new law on TB control, uh, so that we have new standard uh, for care provision, so that today we have a new treatment regimens available. We were implementing BIPAL uh, as a programmatic use, while many countries continue to pilot what has been proven to be effective long ago. And I remember the first um, ideas and our hesitancy when we started implementing BIPAL in July last year uh, within an operational research. And I'm very grateful uh, for our Ukrainian country, for uh, TB people, for patients organizations, for our regional TB services, for supporting the initiative of the national program, that we all together agreed to implement BIPAL in very complex circumstances of the war. And today you see the conclusion, 89% of people successfully cured, despite the lack of access to care, um, sometimes without proper monitoring, uh, more than 100 patients, as of now, have been cured. If we uh, hadn't made that step, many of them would still be uh, continuing treatment or would have interrupted treatment because of the war. Another important thing is uh, the mental health program. That's the lesson we uh, couldn't uh, perfectly understand during COVID. At that time, we needed to introduce um, comprehensive programs for patients and for staff, but unfortunately, at least in our country, there were uh, certain initiatives uh, that were failed to be implemented full scale. Therefore, we call upon all the countries to pay closer attention to the uh, guidelines published by the World Health Organization. It's very uh, important for uh, practical implementation of mental health programs. Nowadays, we implement a mental health problem with the support uh, from our first lady. Uh, we have established a set of units which coordinate the work. We have uh, several initiatives in this area and we have engaged a set of partners in order to support healthcare providers and our patients. And so the key conclusion is that uh, the key most important resource is our staff members, healthcare staff members, because they bear on their shoulders the load of work and crisis, and they go through, they persevere, and therefore all our uh, efforts are to be to support healthcare providers, special workers, social workers, uh, and only working as a joint team, only creating these motivated teams uh, of NTP staff, international partners, internal partners, social workers, non-governmental organizations, patients, uh, communities, uh, would we be able to persevere and to be resilient and um, live through all the difficulties? And therefore, I would like to ask uh, my colleagues to switch on their cameras so that you can see the people who bear their responsibility for healthcare. And I would like to thank anyone who supports Ukraine. Your contribution is um, really valuable. Only this helps us to go further, to go on. Uh, 
it helps us to set new ambitious challenges uh, to conquer TB. Thank you for your attention. Almira, the mic is yours. Yana, thank you very much. The experience you shared with us today resembles perseverance, dedication, and uh, the dedication to uh, the course despite the war in the face of this uh, tra tragedy. Uh, I'm sorry for being emotional. It's very difficult to be impartial. So we uh, continue. And if you have uh, questions, you can ask them in the chat. And our next presenter, uh, our next speaker, I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Mahmoud Rashidov, who will share experience and knowledge of Kazakhstan in the area of uh, provision of TB care in the context of large geographical distances. Good day, dear colleagues. Um, hello, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, to share the experience of um, Kazakhstan. You see my slides and hear me well. So I wanted uh, to tell you about provision of TB care in the context of large geographical distances. I will tell you how we do it in Kazakhstan. As you uh, see on the map, Kazakhstan is one of the countries in Central Asia. It's very big, its territory is really big. If we measure the distance from east to west, about 3,000 kilometers from the north to the south is about uh, 1,700 kilometers. And for you to understand the distance, uh, yesterday we had minus 35 degrees uh, in the north, and in the south it was plus 15. So you see the huge distance. Kazakhstan borders uh, on the Russian Federation and the length of the border is really huge as 7,500 kilometers. It's perhaps the biggest land border. It also uh, borders on China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. It consists of 17 regions. Uh, we also have three big uh, cities, Astana, Shukment, Almaty. Uh, they are of Republican importance. Uh, the share of urban population is almost 62% and the share of rural population is 38%. And uh, it, the country ranks nine by the territory in the world. A few words about uh, TB situation. Here you see uh, incidents which has been decreasing over the last uh, 20 plus years per 100,000 population. And uh, TB notification rate of uh, refampusing resistant TB has been also decreasing. Here you see in more detail uh, the incidence and mortality per 100,000 population uh, for nine months. And compared to 19, you see that uh, both prevalence and the incidence has been, have all been decreasing. You see also uh, the rates in children. So we observe stable uh, reduction. In 2019, almost uh, 14,000 population. Uh, in over the nine months of 2020-23, only 10,000 population. Of them, MDRTB was uh, notified in uh, 4,000 800 and in 2019 it was more than 10,000 and you can see uh, also drastic reduction for XDRTB cases and with the emergence of new drugs the rate of XDRTB started to decrease uh, as of now we have only 21 percent of XDR and uh, uh, and we uh, have only a few uh, patients with chronic TB disease uh, you see treatment outcomes in Kazakhstan, 87.8 uh, for susceptible cases. Uh, I think it's a pretty good rate. Uh, it used to be at about 90% and hopefully next year we will improve it and 
Uh, for the cohort of reform person resistant on the RTB, the uh, success rate has slightly reduced, 76.1%, but hopefully uh, because all, all of all the efforts, we will improve the success rate. That's uh, what I was uh, telling you about. You see the, the country is really big and you see the average distance from the district center to the center of the region. On average, it's uh, 203 kilometers. That's on average the distance from the regional center to the uh, place of residence. 256 in Karaganda and in Pavlodar region, perhaps it's the shortest, it's 119. And 79 districts um, have this uh, distance which exceeds 200 kilometers. But in each regional center, we have a center for physiopulmonology and we also have uh, three uh, centers for physiopulmonology in three big cities. In all uh, towns or cities, we have uh, polyclinics, we have also central district uh, hospitals and polyclinics. In each village, uh, there is an outpatient clinic and in remote areas, we have fellowship obstetric units. A few words about uh, TB detection and diagnosis of TB in Kazakhstan. As I have already mentioned, in each uh, uh, district, in each region, we have district or regional hospitals. We all have city um, hospitals and polyclinics, and we have mobile units, which on a schedule visit each uh, place of residence. They have this scheduled, uh, they perform rounds, they visit all the uh, villages and they perform X-ray examination, first and foremost in the risk groups and uh, the rest of population as well. We have 147 gene experts um, in all polyclinics in all um, district centers and in major polyclinics. Sometimes we have one unit for uh, one uh, or sometimes for two or three regions. And if uh, TB is sus suspected, sputum is collected and then sputum is uh, uh, delivered to the closest center. The system is well adjusted. The vehicle is provided by the healthcare facility, and this helps to transport sputum samples, and the samples are processed at the closest facility equipped gen expert. Uh, mostly uh, testing is performed at uh, the level of primary healthcare or in hospitals, regardless of the form of ownership, no matter whether those uh, facilities are private or uh, state. Inpatient facility is um, provided only in the regional centers of physiopulmonology and uh, at the national center for physiopulmonology of the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Kazakhstan. When a patient provides a simple uh, a sputum sample and if to be his diagnosis, then the person is referred for further examination to, uh, to identify drug susceptibility by a molecular test in each uh, district center. Uh, we have uh, centers of physiopulmonology, we have Bactec uh, machines, we, we have also Hein tests available in almost all um, uh, regions. And also we have uh, capacity uh, to perform DST to second line drugs. And the first line uh, DSTs are performed as well. But in uh, now we have only centralized uh, 
uh, units in um, regional centers. In districts, we do not perform this type of diagnosis. Sputum is collected in villages twice a year. We have uh, vehicles coming, collecting sputum samples, and we deliver sputum samples uh, to the cities for testing. TB uh, diagnosis is made by a special centralized medical advisory commission in the centers for physiopulmonology. Sometimes it is performed online because uh, remote regions do not come or the representative do not come, especially in the winter times where there is lots of snow and they present their cases online. We have special uh, online platforms so that uh, physicians in the polyclinic can present a case, show X-ray um, images, and uh, discuss the diagnosis. Uh, those who are uh, located closer, they can come and uh, they can um, present their cases uh, in person. As for the treatment, uh, people who are infectious, who shed bacilli, they are admitted to the center of physiopulmonology. People who uh, cannot uh, tolerate treatment or who are social disadvantaged, uh, they can also be admitted uh, for the initiation of treatment. And some people uh, stay admitted uh, uh, for the long duration, for the whole duration of treatment, but because of social reasons. We provide them an opportunity to remain in the hospital to get uh, treatment. If uh, people are not infections, then they are offered an opportunity to be treated uh, as an outpatient from day one. And there are several options. In every uh, uh, every village or a bigger uh, community has an, either a felcher obstetric point or uh, an outpatient clinic, and a person can visit such a clinic to uh, take treatment under DOT, or uh, people can choose video-supported treatment. If there is no opportunity to organize video-supported treatment, then home-based treatment is organized when a car and a nurse who gives the drugs uh, come and visit uh, the patient. Video-supported treatment has become really uh, widespread because internet services are not expensive. Almost everyone has a mobile phone uh, with uh, internet connection. Uh, usually, uh, people use WhatsApp uh, to get uh, in touch with the nurse uh, who gives the drugs. They record short videos and they send those short videos to the nurse. And uh, all the videos are archived and then deleted in a week. You see the containers, these uh, drug pill boxes are called um, a week box, uh, it has a supply. You see how it's done, a person shows the drugs, then uh, uh, a person shows that uh, the drugs are swallowed and the patients are advised to use um, clear glasses so would, that a nurse could see that the drugs have been actually swallowed. And you see that 63% um, uh, of patients are treated uh, on outpatient basis, uh, we have really improved the situation with the outpatient treatment. It was possible due to good social support on outpatient treatment, people receive uh, uh, a special benefit from social services for timely, uninterrupted treatment. Uh, and these benefits uh, un, do not um, uh, depend upon whether a person works or not. On average, uh, people uh, receive about $80. Uh, video supported treatment was received by 36.9% and um, over the nine months of last year, 
it was 42.3 percent of patients all the patients have uh, got used uh, and many try to adhere to receive the benefit because when people are admitted they uh, do not receive these benefits because uh, uh, treatment is fully covered by the state social support as i have mentioned uh, with the standard of about three percent four point six percent will be allocated uh, about uh, three thousand uh, dollars have been allocated for social support over the nine months. Uh, we closely work with the non-governmental organizations and they have informed about 40,000 of people from the target groups. They help to detect 310 active TB cases. Those were the people uh, who were detected, uh, who were found, identified and detected by NGOs. Uh, the majority of those are homeless or social disadvantaged and uh, they also help to examine 400 contacts and they also work with uh, defaulters 170 defaulters have been brought back to treatment uh, with their forces of uh, non-governmental organizations the government started offering support and within nine months um, a lot of money was allocated in support of those ngos in many regions the majority of uh, them received funds from the local budget. And those uh, organizations work with the patients. Some words about the clinical monitoring and the way it is organized. Patients are supposed to have their test done uh, they can do it locally. Um, it can be done in the rural areas or in the cities. Now, um, uh, our healthcare facilities have uh, agreements with the laboratories, and our patients do not need to, to go to um, the district centers. They can be tested locally and uh, their specimens will be delivered uh, to the district centers we have vehicles that commute back and forth and um, when the tests are uh, ready they will receive uh, their results in email Uh, we have uh, one TB specialist that oversees uh, the work that is performed in the districts uh, of the country, and uh, that TB specialist is responsible for the follow-up of the patients. If patients need to have the x-ray done or some additional evaluation done, they uh, visit the district centers. Patients can use the funds allocated for the social support uh, to cover their transportation expenses. Patients told us that they do not spend any money for the laboratory examinations because they can um, collect their specimens locally. This is the end of my presentation, and should you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Thank you very much, Mahmoud, for sharing a very interesting presentation. Indeed, you have a unique experience in um, TB care provision in uh, such a big country, and it was uh, interesting to see how you organized video supported treatment it was good to know that you actively engage ngos uh, that you actively rely on social contracting so thank you very much once again
Dear colleagues, now I would like to remind you that you can ask your questions in chat. And now I would like to give uh, the floor to our third speaker for today, Dr. Shaknuz Azamo from Tajikistan, who will tell us about experience in collaboration with the civil society for provision of people-centered TB care in Tajikistan's communities. Shaknuz, are you with us? Yes, Elmira, thank you. Nicole will turn my camera off because uh, our internet connection is not very good. I would like to say that uh, in Tajikistan, just like in other countries, we have uh, some experience in collaboration with uh, NGOs. Our Stop TB Association is very active in the country. And I would like to say that our activities and experience in this field is uh, well documented and reflected in uh, the national program for TB control. It includes five tasks, the main ones, and those uh, main tasks have subtasks. Subtask number four focuses on provision of social support and collaboration with uh, the private sector and NGOs. And um, I decided to share some quotes from uh, subtask number four. As you can see, as part of the social contracting, we're supposed to ensure contracts with NGOs uh, that provide well, uh, various, sites, uh, various types of support. Uh, they uh, started getting governmental contracts, and the national program has been uh, very effective in that. Subtest number four also says that we're supposed to provide financial support encouraging patients to adhere to treatment. We know that this kind of support really uh, affects treatment outcomes and provide good financial support to the patients. We try to engage social workers so that they could uh, provide uh, support to the patients locally. In the past, uh, only um, partner organizations had the uh, uh, NGOs working in the regions. Uh, we also have uh, standards for service delivery. By uh, the community organizations. And now we see the need to update these standards. We also believe that it is important to use digital technologies. We use them in our practice and they show good results. Later on, I will tell you in more details about the use of digital technologies. Uh, within the framework of subtask four, we need to ensure procurement of electronic devices to increase adherence to treatment. Within the TB control program, we provide social support and provision of treatment adherence support through the systematic follow-up. We know it is very important, so especially for uh, patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis. They encounter a lot of challenges and the social workers provide very good support to the patients. They help identify the challenges. 
and they also uh, inform treatment physicians about the challenges that their patients are facing. And we see that um, the number of patients who interrupt their treatment decreases continuously. Our patients receive various types of support from the government, from the private sector, from the partner organizations, from the local authorities. And NGOs. In our country, we also offer psychosocial counseling by creating a supportive psychosocial environment. It's very important for patients with drug resistant tuberculosis. Most often, this kind of support uh, is provided by the social workers at the local level. But those social workers can also make sure that patients in need of uh, medical care being referred to the healthcare facilities. We have special platforms that allow communication of patients with the physicians. And this is another way to provide uh, psychosocial support to the patients. We also provide a social follow-up uh, to TB affected people. We know that among TB patients, uh, we have those who are not very adherent to treatment. They may have uh, problems with housing or they um, can be addicted to alcohol and other substances. So we have a special group that provides the necessary support to uh, these patients and to make sure that they complete the course of treatment. NTP and uh, NGOs organize meetings at different levels organize focus groups that are of uh, advocacy nature. In our country, we use social network in order to distribute the information. And uh, the population of our country uses uh, these social networks a lot. We also know that there is a group of patients in need of legal support. Most often, they are the ones who are inmates or are just about to be released from the penitentiary facilities. These people need support in obtaining the necessary documents and do not have any work. These patients uh, need support in obtaining benefits and other types of um, aid, and we are eager to do so. Uh, we provide social, uh, psychosocial TB counseling for close contacts of TB patients. Uh, we provide support at patients' home. We also implement advocacy activities, uh, especially when we know that uh, our patients do not work but are willing to work, and we offer the necessary uh, support 
in uh, providing training or in finding jobs. So we help to acquire some practical skills and people uh, undergo training and our social workers and TB centers uh, help them to uh, undergo this brief training, but nevertheless to help to acquire some practical skills to get a job. Usually people receive a certain certificate which helps to find a job and start procuring for their family, providing for the family. And uh, this slide depicts the situation within advocacy work, within meetings with partnership and within various activities. We see dedication from the local authorities. We have we see this focus on supporting patients. You see that over the last nine months, nine months, fifty TB patients received a certain amount of money by mosques. Uh, mosques uh, perform special services on Fridays, during which they inform people about TB, they raise awareness, and uh, faith leaders collect some money donated by the uh, people, and that money is then sent for social su support. We also provide food uh, packages in pilot regions. We have a set of organizations which um, lead those uh, pilots, but this practice is used not only in six pilot regions, and we try to scale up this uh, practice of providing uh, food packages. We also provide some additional uh, support, uh, and we try engaging not only state uh, facilities, but some private organizations which can uh, take responsibility for supporting and supervising a number of people. We also perform uh, sp special shows or concerts or other activities uh, during which we raise money. And uh, all raised uh, money is then uh, allocated to uh, support. Uh, and that helped us to help a pretty big number of people. As for uh, uh, video support, we perform a project with Stop TB Partnership. On average, about 500 TB patients have been enrolled on video supported uh, practice. They have downloaded them. Uh, platform um, such as a WhatsApp or Viber or other messenger to make uh, brief videos and then share those videos with the healthcare providers. Uh, also within the same project, 300 smartphones have been purchased for the physicians and it is uh, those smartphones are used uh, to have some feedback with the patients and provide some guidance and observe treatment. And also the smartphones uh, have been provided for the patients. And those smartphones uh, remain and serve as an incentive for the patients. And it's part of the peer-to-peer uh, -peer program of work. And, uh, Mobile connection is also partially funded within the projects. We also purchase special drug boxes or containers uh, used by our patients. Uh, we also use uh, clear glasses, as our colleagues have also showed, for recording these videos for video-supported treatment. We also work closely with the, the Global Fund in this area, with the, the MSF project and USAID project. Uh, this year, uh, this work comes to an end, but we, uh, the Global Fund uh, provides uh, money for social support to patients with drug-resistant TB. 
and uh, today the top of 842 patients received uh, this financial support and Uh, and the new grant of the Global Fund also uh, provides some money for the social uh, financial support for the patients. MSF project also um, provides some social support, including hygiene packages um, to the patients and to members of uh, the patient's family because they all serve as a special group and it's important to motivate uh, the patients and the family members. USAID also uh, provided some uh, support and uh, when the USAID project ends, uh, the plan is to switch uh, provision of services to the national TB program. And we um, believe that uh, the service will be uh, provided uh, by the state. Uh, here you see pictures uh, depicting our work, provision of smartphones, uh, several, uh, several meetings were held together with local authorities where we explained um, the uh, situation and tries to raise awareness to strengthen social support of people who undergo TB treatment. Here you see Hatlon region and other, uh, other regions had similar meetings. Uh, here I would like to share uh, with you that in 2021, we received the first grant for $20,000 for two years, uh, state contracting. Uh, with the first uh, non-governmental organization. Early January 2023, the Ministry of Health signed a contract or memorandum on uh, social state social contracting with five additional NGOs. And uh, this week, uh, the tender will come to an end. We will know uh, who is the winner and what amount of money is going to be allocated. So in uh, 2024, we will have six non-governmental organizations working under social state contracting in the country. That's my last slide. I would like to say that in addition to social support provided by our partners and uh, non-governmental organization, we also have some state uh, mechanisms. We have regions where local authorities have undertaken uh, the initiative and provide uh, food packages and other types of support. That's all. Thank you very much. If there are questions, I will be very glad to answer. Thank you very much, Shahnoza, for an interesting uh, presentation of your experience. We have uh, questions. <clears throat> I would like to say that we have seven minutes left till the end. And therefore, I would like to summarize the question. Some questions have been already answered in the chat. You can read through the uh, chat. Shahnoz, I will start with the questions addressed to you. Uh, first and foremost, thank you, Arseni. Arseni, right, thank you for interesting experience and practice on working with mosques. Could you please uh, share uh, more experience. Uh, how did you manage to uh, persuade uh, your faith leaders to work with you? Thank you, Arseni. Uh, we uh, work together with the Stop TB Partnership and with the National 
TB program. First, we delivered uh, opening trainings to the representatives of mosques in pilot regions. And after they were fully improved, in, informed on TB, and when they understood that uh, people needed their support, that their support was actually um, needed in the regions they served, they um, started actively participating. We tried to engage them uh, to our activities on TB control. And uh, uh, we have leaders among, among faith leaders, and uh, we try to uh, organize uh, this uh, experience sharing practices. Uh, at first, we were afraid that it would be difficult, but it turned out to be easier than we thought. You start, you will need to start with awareness raising and explaining what TB is. Thank you, Shahnoza. Uh, a question to Mahmoud. Uh, one question, but of three aspects. I will be very brief answering. Do we have a reporting form on the dosages taken? So the question is whether there are reporting forms on the doses taken under video supported treatment. Uh, do you use a standard form? as the one used under DOT. And do you keep this video reports? Yes, we have reporting forms. We have a special uh, register uh, uh, in each uh, cabinet. And we also use TB01. And every nurse who gives the drugs uh, also has a, a computer access uh, to the uh, register and every uh, nurse who gives drugs has access and inputs data. And I would like to thank our national TB, uh, con uh, TB program, the Global Fund and all the partners. Uh, there is a special order under which all the video recordings are kept for 10 days and then they are deleted and replaced with them. Uh, uh, next portion, which I kept also for 10 days. But uh, reporting forms are the same. Uh, reporting forms uh, for drugs. Thank you for your answer. Um, dear speakers, thank you very much for your collaboration and for your contribution to the webinars. And I would like to thank you for your daily routine work on providing our patients with the high quality TB services. And I would like to pass the mic to Dr. Askahi Delbay for uh, final remarks. Thank you, Elmira, dear colleagues, uh, Alana, Jana, uh, Mahmoud, Shahnoza. Thank you very much for uh, um, conveying important messages on these topical issues, which are important for the region. and. They underline the need to uh, scale up uh, uh, the capacity and uh, increase uh, the availability of various modes of care provision uh, in various conditions. And despite all the challenges and all the difficulties faced by our countries, there are lots of opportunities. And if we strengthen the capacity and if we continue to work in this area we'll reach all the goals set forth by the new regional action plan including those on uh, improving uh, treatment success rate and reaching 80 uh, percent jointly it uh, can be done the next topic will serve as a continuation of today's uh, topic and as a conclusion i would like to thank all of you and i would like to thank all of you a uh, good holiday season a uh, good uh, health and uh, express our gratitude to your immense work thank you very much and uh, good uh, good year to all of you see you next year thank you for participation Good day, dear colleagues.